Good morning and welcome to Cross Lanes United Methodist Church. We are continuing our Lenten season of recovery, a season in which we are visiting the healing stories in Matthew to remind ourselves that we follow a God who attends to all of who we are, body, mind, and soul. Today we will explore the story of Jesus calming the storm and discover that alongside our personhood, Jesus also cares for and has sovereignty over creation itself. A story which tells us that there is nothing beyond God's reach and no person, place, or thing beyond God's mercy. Nothing which is not under God's care. We have uh, taken on a practice of beginning our worship time during Lent with a prayer of confession, which today focuses on the healing of creation and our care for the earth. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the beginning, you created this universe with a phrase, let it be. And the waters and the dry land and the sky and the creatures were formed. You set humanity among these wonders and invited us to care and honor all things. We have not successfully answered that call. Seeing the abundance as a feast that would never end, we gorged ourselves, taking more than we could replenish at a rate that could not be sustained. We are beginning to comprehend the magnitude, beginning to see that the things cannot just keep going as usual and not have dire consequences. We are frightened, which is partly why we are slow to accept it. But we now are witnesses to the forces of a world more broken than the one we inherited. Water, wind and wave, fire, drought and earthquake, all things that signal it is time to pay attention to and make real change. Too often we think there is nothing we can do, that the change required is too great. It all feels overwhelming and so we look away, sometimes even from the small things that could make a difference for our own community. Let us pray together. Help us, healer. Show us our ability to chart a different course. Forgive our inaction. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. In our tradition, confessions are followed by an assurance of pardon to remind us that we are broken, but we are not alone. After facing our sin and confessing it to God, we cannot be the same as we were before, and yet we can be whole, beautiful, purposed. Today, know this. Jesus asks us to do hard things, knowing we are capable, no matter what. We can change in order to heal May the calm of Christ be with you, with me, and with all. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
week here at Cross Lanes United Methodist Church, we set aside time for our youngest disciples to think and pray about scripture in a way that's meant specifically for their age and development. So if you have kids in your house, please make sure that they know this is a time just for them. Hello, friends. Remember, we are in Lent. That's why I'm wearing purple, and you see purple here on the altar. Lent is a special 40-day period in the church that we slow down in a special way to think and pray about what we can do to love God and neighbor. Even Jesus, who was really special in a lot of ways, had to think and pray to be close to God. It helped Jesus make decisions and to be a good helper. It slowed him down when things got busy and it allowed him to celebrate good things that happened to him, as well as working through some of the hard stuff that happened to him. Thinking and praying does the same for us. It helps us slow down so that we can talk to God instead of just talking at God. Today we're going to slow down by praying breath prayers. Breath prayers are short prayers you can say in one breath. For half the prayer you inhale, that's breathe in, and for half the prayer you exhale, breathing out. Now you can make breath prayers up by choosing a word or a brief phrase to repeat, like, thank you God for this day. That's a great phrase of thanksgiving. And if you cut it in half, you can say part of it breathing in, part of it breathing out. Something like, thank you, God, for this day. See how easy it is? Now, if you aren't sure about making up your own, you could always use a Bible verse. For example, something short like Psalm 56, 3, which says, when I am afraid, I will trust you. Or Romans 15, 13. Fill me, God, with peace and joy. So if you split those up, like we did with the last one, you inhale on part of it and exhale on part of it. So uh, we'll go back to the psalm. On the inhale, we could think or say to ourselves, when I am afraid, then on the exhale, think or say, I will trust you. Let's try it together. When I am afraid, I will trust you. Breathing in and out helps bring us some calm, and it gives us just the right amount of time to remind ourselves of God's presence all throughout the day. I hope you and your favorite grown-up can try it this week. For now, let's maybe practice one more together uh, for our closing prayer. Here at Cross Lanes United Methodist Church, when we pray together, we clap our hands, and then you can repeat after me. On your breath in, you'll say, Oh God, and on your breath out, be with us. Oh God, be with us. Amen. It was good to be with you today, friends.
our scripture comes from Matthew 8, verses 18 to 27. You'll notice as we read it that there's no people healings in this scripture, meaning unlike the rest of the scriptures in this series, there isn't a person who's ill and made well. Instead, the miracle that occurs in this story is a miracle of nature, and it's all about uh, Jesus using his power to beckon people to follow him. Let's read together. Now, when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. A scribe then approached and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the airs have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And a windstorm arose on the sea so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus was asleep. And they went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. And the disciples were amazed, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today's passage starts out with Jesus making plans to cross the sea, taking his word and call about the kingdom of God to a new group of folks. When a couple of people who have seen what Jesus can do and have heard him teach and preach, they approach him, hoping to travel alongside him as disciples. The first says, Jesus, I will follow you anywhere. Now we need to remember where Jesus is. Jesus is a man from Galilee who had set up shop in the more metropolitan area of Capernaum. At the same time Jesus was teaching and preaching in Capernaum, uh, King Herod was building a home place for himself and his brother's wife in Tiberias, just down the road. Herod Antipas was also building a home at the same time in Sepphoris near Nazareth, Jesus' home place. So I imagine Jesus had these mansions in his mind when he turned to the would-be disciple and says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Not only would those who follow Jesus be rejected and therefore constantly itinerating, unlike what the scribe would have been used to, which was seeing a teacher in one place, it was also true that Jesus was making a point that that no one who followed him would ever again feel at home in a world built by men like Herod. Then the second man approaches and, and says to Jesus, uh, I want to come with you, but I need to first bury my father. And Jesus' response, let the dead bury the dead, uh, seems a bit harsh on the outset. But we know that elsewhere in scripture, Jesus speaks about how important important it is to honor one's parents. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It's a high law. So Jesus knows that it's important for folks to obey their father and mother and really, really important for them to prepare burials. So I don't think this is a passage about Jesus encouraging a man to abandon his family. Jesus's response seems to indicate that when it comes to following him, there is never too soon a time. Following Christ is urgent, and discipleship prioritizes God above all other relationships. It places a person within a new first family, the church. Following Jesus means not waiting or dwelling with that which deals in death, but moving forward with God at the first opportunity into new life, into a new kind of kingdom and family configuration. Now, we don't hear what the men decide to do. Uh, we don't know if they go with Jesus. What we do know is that Jesus isn't done with his lesson about the kingdom of God and how he will reign. Because what happens next is Jesus gets in a boat with a bunch of disciples. And once on board, Jesus retires to his quarters and begins to sleep 
when a terrible storm comes upon them. The boat begins to take on water and the disciples fear they will perish. And so they wake Jesus up, sure that they didn't sign up to follow him and just to drown. When Jesus wakes, he holds his disciples accountable. Why do you have so little faith? The kingdom of God was about more than just following Jesus when it was easy, uh, when, when where he led them would make sense. It was also about adopting the peace of heart and the boldness of spirit, not to fear in the face of enormous danger, the outskirts, the hard places, which is where Jesus tended to make his home. Now, while Jesus asks the question, the winds and the sea come to a calm, And the disciples being along the Mediterranean, they had seen storms dissipate before, but this wasn't like that. There were no choppy waters in the aftermath, no cloud gray sky, no moisture in the hull of the boat. The chaotic scene just turns quiet, a miracle in nature. What looked scary for a moment had been in God's hands all along. Jesus' instructions to follow were really meant to shake these disciples. His instructions were both Jewish and deeply radical. In some ways, he held strong to to, um, deep Jewish tradition. He used the words and images of scripture. But in other ways, his theology and interpretation of faithful living were completely new because no one had ever been God and human at the same time. Jesus wasn't just like Moses or the prophets. Jesus is the one to whom Moses and the prophets pointed. And so Jesus had the authority uh, of over the law that he could beckon his followers in ways other leaders could not. He was God with us, Emmanuel, and he had a mission. His mission was to exercise God's power in the world. In Matthew, we hear that mission uh, manifested, uh, namely to heal and to forgive. So his mission was not to make his followers comfortable, to offer them the riches of the world, to provide them superiority over their neighbors, or or to give them strong military leadership, or codependence that would let them follow God and still do exactly as they pleased. Now, his interactions can seem isolated, like one-off pieces of direction. But taken together... They're an introduction for the community to this upside-down ethics that Christianity would introduce in the world. This idea that where God shows up, things are different than you should assume. In the kingdom of God, the prince is homeless, and the pursuit of life takes precedent over the memory of what came before. Disciples are people willing to go with God anywhere to confront the problems, the issues, the sins of the world without hesitation about who, their fathers or mothers, would be disappointed. Following Jesus meant a transformed life. Eyes opened to the injustice and destruction and death that was present in the world. Hands opened ready to confront it all. In the face of great danger and confrontation, disciples do not fear content that God's will cannot be undone by any one person or any one event. Now, in a lot of ways, I feel for Jesus's followers in this passage. They were just trying to go from one day to the next with a little hope in their lives. They were pretty sure they wanted to be on Jesus's team uh, when times got tough, but they suffered from partial understanding. Jesus was more than a healer. And until they could get that through their brains, they would not understand the call he had placed on their lives. They didn't yet understand how a kingdom would be built without brick or mortar, without the oppression of the people who first oppressed them. They did not yet understand how Jesus could both be homeless and at home everywhere, or how he could override the Mosaic law concerning burials, They did not yet see how God's being is in the very fabric of the earth they walked. And so even the winds and storms would obey him. They did not yet understand that the salvation they desired would cost them and 
it would cost God. So they were struck with awe, made timid by all the trauma and disappointment in their life. They had not yet figured out that God's presence is saturating, completely available, and also completely challenging and beautiful. They didn't understand that in addition to healing them, Jesus would also save them. And I, I do understand that. I, I also want to follow Jesus, though I am still figuring out what that means. I, too, carry only a partial understanding of Jesus. So these disciples today, they help me reflect on my ability to follow. The circumstances are a bit different now, and so we can contextualize the questions a little bit. You know, am I willing to follow Jesus, even if it means having no place to lay my head? For me, this is the same as asking, am I really willing to feel out of place for the mission of the church? For instance, um, as a white person, am I willing to enter conversations where I might be the minority in the room? Am I willing to speak against injustices even when it appears alone I have no chance against the massive systems at play in our country? Am I willing uh, to enter into nuanced, complicated, and often inconvenient relationships with the poor? Because if I had to guess, Jesus would be in all those places. Am I willing to let the dead bear the dead? For me, this hits as a question at its core about letting go. Am I willing to let go of that which was once vital but is no longer bearing life? Am I willing to let go of unhealthy relationships? Am I willing to let go of financial practices that don't honor God? Am I willing to adjust when ministries I love are no longer life-giving? Am I willing to trust God in the midst of impossibly bad circumstances? You know, that question all those folks had on that boat. For me, this is really a way of asking, in what ways have my anxiety and fear held me back from being a witness to God's saturating presence? How can I turn to awe instead of fear when I don't understand what is going on around me? You know, this, this story, um, a set of stories, is also told in parts of Mark and Luke. And in those stories, Jesus' action is slightly different. In Luke, the man who wants to bury his father is told not to follow Jesus into the boat, but instead to go from that moment with missionaries to proclaim the kingdom. And he adds that anyone, Jesus adds, that anyone who has to look back in fear for their families is not fit for service. In Mark, uh, when, when we see Jesus in the midst of the storm, Jesus commands the storm to be still. And in the end, the disciples are said to have feared a great fear. But in Matthew's telling of the story, he prioritizes Jesus' power and ability to draw others along. Even the ones who don't understand, even the ones who are still figuring it out, even the ones who um, miss the mark sometimes. In Matthew's version of things, Jesus is able to calm the storm with, uh, by rebuking it, and the disciples, instead of being afraid, were amazed. Right? They marveled at Jesus, who proves over and over again that the kingdom of God is both accessible to humanity and challenging to anyone who dare enter. But I do, uh, what I love about this story is that for all the disciples' partial understanding, for all their mistakes and shortcomings, for all their fears, for the variety of their questions, they are still invited to follow. At any one time, we might not get what God is doing in our midst. But today we're reminded that we won't always. God's movements in the world are often a mixture of tradition and radical newness that we can't quite comprehend. And yet we are still called to follow, still called to put one faithful foot in front of the other while we figure it out, while we listen to Jesus as best we can, while we watch God perform miracles, while we face enormous obstacles that test our sense of peace. So if you're out there today and you've been 
um, struggling to feel like this season of recovery is working for you, like maybe you're alone, you're not uh, worthy, you've gotten it wrong too many times, don't lose heart. (laughs) You're in good company, biblical company. Inexplicably, God loves us even now. And as we turn our hearts to Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter, we will be further affirmed in our scripture reading. Disciples get it wrong all the time. But God holds on. God does not let us drown. God does not fail. May that challenge and amaze us. Amen. As we continue to think about what these words from Matthew might mean for us, I just want to highlight this week from the healing story the words, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. These may seem like harsh words, and yet we hear in them Jesus' urgency. Now is the time to move. No matter how difficult, we cannot wait, right? It doesn't matter if you think you're worthy of being a disciple. What is past is past. There is brokenness and there are casualties in its wake, but we can move forward. We can make changes. We can face storms because we are people led by the healer, the calm in the storm, who can offer us faith in the midst of fear. You can think about that this week as you continue your Lenten discipline of reflection with your Lenten workbook, this time with an emphasis on environmental health throughout your week. And remember that if you need a place of quiet to sit with your reflections and the actions they may birth, The sanctuary is open on the Sundays of Lent from 4 to 5 p.m. Sisters and brothers, we've heard the good news. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears. Follow me. Now go forth. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.